This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Dead Reckoning. Welcome to our first ever second part of an episode in the history of the GM Word of the Week. That's right, this is a multi-part episode. And it's not even a two-parter. We're going all out with a bona fide three-parter. Oh, and note our pronunciation. It ain't bone fide. It's Latin. Bona fide means good faith. And it has become a legal term that means without any intention to trick or deceive. Sure, we generally think of it as meaning genuine or for realsies as we were led to believe the kids say. But it also means, in legal parlance, that a person did something without any dishonest motives. For example, if you go into a store and purchase something that turns out to have been stolen, you aren't responsible for buying stolen property. That's because you made a bona fide purchase. You had no reason to believe that a legitimate business would sell something that was stolen. But we digress. Already. This episode is a follow-up to our previous episode. If you haven't listened to our episode about the Carrick, you probably should. Because this episode picks up where that one leaves off, with the history of sailing ships and travel and exploration. When we left off, we discussed the invention of the Latin or triangular sail, and that sail made it possible to cross any body of water without being at the mercy of the wind. And this sail first appeared in the Mediterranean Sea sometime between 800 and 900 CE. That puts it squarely, or triangularly, in the Middle Ages, which is exactly the sort of time period that Dungeons and Dragons and Dragon Quest and the early Final Fantasies and all the other fantasy media are based on. But we also said that it would be extremely dangerous for a ship to cross the open ocean. And if you know anything about history, you also know that the so-called Age of Exploration didn't really get kick-started until the late 1400s and early 1500s. And that brings us around to the question this part will answer. If ships were big enough and strong enough to voyage across the open sea, and if they had the sorts of sails that would let them sail with impunity, why did it take 700 years for anyone to start making those voyages? And no, it wasn't because people thought the world was flat and you could sail off the edge. Let's get that out of the way right now. As we've discussed in the past, the Greeks knew that the Earth was round. They had figured it out by noting things like where the sun sat on the sky during early sailing voyages around the coast of Africa, and how there were different stars in the northern sky and the southern sky, and how the Earth cast a circular shadow on the moon during eclipses. They even estimated the size of the Earth to a pretty reasonable degree of accuracy, considering they were working with shadows and math. And no one ever forgot that. Throughout the Middle Ages, anyone with any education knew that the Earth was round. So why didn't people start crossing the Atlantic Ocean until 700 years after their ships could actually do it? Not counting the Vikings who had leapfrogged from Europe to Iceland to Greenland to Newfoundland and hadn't really crossed any open ocean to any significant degree? Well, partly. It's because there really wasn't any reason to. See, broadly speaking, in the Middle Ages, you could divide what we might term the known world or the old world into three regions. You had Europe, you had Eurasia in the Middle East, and you had India and China in the Far East. Now, there had been trade between the three regions for a long time, facilitated primarily by the Persian Empire. The Romans had been trading with India as early as the first century BCE and Roman traders and ambassadors had visited China through the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd centuries of the Common Era. But all of that changed around 640 CE with the founding of Islam and the Muslim conquest of the Middle East. European and Asian trade was essentially cut off, and we all know what followed that kept both the Middle East and Europe occupied for a few hundred years. That's right, the Crusades a series of political and religious wars between the nations of Europe and the Islamic Caliphates that ruled the Middle East and Northern Africa. There were a total of nine distinct wars, nine crusades, that ended when Muslim forces seized the Christian-controlled city of Acre. The crusades were extremely costly 
and after the fall of Acre, divisions in the Christian church, as well as a war weariness across Europe, prevented the Holy Roman Empire and Byzantium from drumming enthusiasm for any more crusades. With the crusades out of the way, time would have been ripe for exploration across the sea. But something else happened to negate the need for significant overseas exploration. What you have to understand is that the European nations weren't really interested in exploration for its own sake to any great degree. Ships were costly. Voyages were costly. And if you weren't earning a profit, it wasn't worth sending a ship. It was really trade that drove exploration. And in the early 1300s, something happened to help establish overland trade between Europe and Asia without having to go through the Muslim lands of the Middle East. Overland trade across Central Asia was dangerous. The area was fractured into various tribal confederations. These tribes, among them were the Tartans and the Mongols, were violent and militaristic. They would raid each other's lands, plunder their camps and towns, and they would attack travelers and caravans with impunity. And then, in Mongol lands, Timujin was born. Legends say that when Timujin, whose name means shaper of iron, was born, he was clutching a blood clot in his hand from inside his mother's womb. His father was poisoned by a rival tribe when he was only 10, and Timujin, his mother, and his six siblings were left to starve by their own clan. Instead, shortly thereafter, Timujin killed his older brother and claimed control of his family. His life was violent and unpredictable, as were the lives of most of the tribal peoples of Asia, and he built a reputation as a powerful warrior and skillful leader. Timujin was quite visionary. He rejected the customs of his people and chose the most competent of his allies for leadership positions rather than choosing relatives or friends. When enemy tribes were conquered, he would have the tribe's leader executed and then absorb the rest of the tribe into his own rather than enslaving the lot of them. Gradually, Timujin brought the various tribes of Asia under his control and proclaimed himself Genghis Khan, which means leader of all. Genghis Khan worked hard to unify the tribes, and he recognized that the old ways of tribal infighting could destroy his empire and his people. He established a meritocracy, banning the inheritance of political titles. He banned the kidnapping and enslavement of members of the Mongol Empire, especially women, and he made theft illegal. He ordered the creation of a common writing system to further unify the culture, and he established the freedom to follow any religion. Of course, Genghis Khan also pushed for raids and conquests of neighboring lands. He attacked China numerous times, as well as the Khwarezm Empire. And the hordes were not so kind to their enemies as they were to their own people. But none of that is important here. What is important is the Tatar Peace, or Pax Mongolica, as it was called in Europe. See, Genghis Khan's empire stabilized Central Asia. It was no longer a dangerous, lawless land, and Genghis Khan even passed laws to ensure the safety of foreign ambassadors and traders. And that meant Europe, China, and India had a whole new land through which they could safely travel to trade. That meant they didn't have to make any dangerous treks through Muslim lands. Unfortunately, in the 1300s and 1400s, this all fell apart. First, the Mongol Empire dissolved into infighting as Genghis Khan's various successors tried to carve up the empire for themselves. While he had died in the mid-13th century, the ruling Khans that survived him continued to rule the empire as Genghis Khan had designed it. But the empire gradually dissolved and the trade routes, including the famous Silk Path or Road, became unsafe. Second. The Silk Road allowed something else to travel from Asia to Europe. A terrible disease known as the bubonic plague or the Black Death. And with the extensive trade routes and crowded dirty cities, the plague spread like a wildfire across Europe and Eurasia. Third, Constantinople, the capital of Byzantium and a major hub of Asian trade routes, was conquered by the Muslim Ottoman Turks effectively locking Christian Europe out of Eurasia and the eastern Mediterranean coast. Until all of that happened, explorers in Europe had no reason to risk long, expensive, and dangerous ocean voyages. But even if they had had a reason to, there was another thing keeping them out of the open sea. 
consider the story of Vedino and Ugolino Vivaldi. In 1291, these two merchants from Genoa found themselves considering the problem of trade with India in the Far East. They reasoned that if the earth were round, they should be able to sail west around the world and come to India from the other way. With a great deal of fanfare, they sailed out of the Mediterranean into the open waters of the Atlantic in two great ships and were never seen again. This event just fanned the flames of fear of the open ocean and sailing out into the unknown. And why was sailing into the unknown so scary and so dangerous? Because there was no way to navigate. And that brings us around to the other half of the history of sailing, the history of navigation. See, it's one thing to navigate on land. You can follow roads, geographic features, distant landmarks, and so on. But in the open ocean, there's nothing to see but ocean. You're completely on your own with nothing to guide you. Moreover, there's no way to resupply if you need to. You can't forage. You can't follow a river to a trading outpost. You have to live off whatever fits in your ship's hold. If your voyage takes too long, you starve or dehydrate. And if you get caught in a storm, you have no shelter. And even if you do find your way somewhere, it's extremely difficult to find your way back to where you came from. Now, ancient cultures had managed to navigate the sea, and they relied primarily on celestial navigation. The first recorded example of celestial navigation comes from Homer's epic The Odyssey, written in the 8th century BCE. In it, the nymph Calypso gives the hero Ulysses directions by way of the constellation Ursa Major. If you somehow don't know, a constellation is a grouping of stars in the sky that resembles a certain shape or has been given a name. Ursa Major is Latin for the Great Bear, and it contains the more well-known constellation the Big Dipper. Eventually, Greek navigators noticed that a particular star, Polaris, seemed to be directly above the top of the world. Thus, if you followed it, you were always going north. But knowing an approximate direction like north or follow the Big Dipper is a far cry from true navigation. When you set out on a long voyage to a particular spot, you have to be pretty dead on. If your aim is even slightly off, you can miss your destination by a lot. Let's put it this way. Let's say you're walking somewhere due north from where you are. If you're just a couple of inches off of true north after a few steps, say you veer three or four inches to the right, after one day of hiking, you're going to be off by 10 miles. And the longer you go before you realize you're going in the wrong direction, the farther off you will be. And that's the problem with stellar navigation. It's inexact. It's easy to be off your mark by a little bit. And you can't remeasure your direction until the next night. By then, you might be off course by dozens of miles. And if you have a few cloudy nights and you can't see the stars, you're done for. And until about the 1200s, the stars were the only way to set your course. So navigators learned to rely on other tricks if they had to sail out of sight of land. For example, Egyptian navigators relied on two inventions. First was the sounding reed, which was just a long reed they would stick into the water to see how deep it was. That told them approximately how close to land they were. Second, they used a wind rose, which was a diagram of the wind strength and direction around a location. The Viking explorer Floki Ilgadarason, discoverer of Iceland, had his own trick. He carried cages full of ravens on his voyages. When he suspected there might be land nearby, or thought his ship should be near its destination, they would release a raven. The raven would fly up and circle the boat looking for land. If it saw land, it would take off in that direction and the ship would follow. Because of this, from the earliest days of sailing, navigators were forced to rely on a practice called dead reckoning. The idea was that if you knew where your ship had started, what direction it was traveling, and how long it traveled for, you could figure out where it would end up. Thus, you could follow a navigation route by pointing your ship in a certain direction and sailing for a certain length of time. Roughly. Because your direction, gleaned from the sun and stars, was pretty vague. And you had to guess at your ship's speed. 
and you could only roughly estimate how much time had passed. In the 13th century, an invention became popular in Europe that made things a bit easier and also facilitated another invention. First, there was the magnetic compass. The magnetic compass was a magnetic needle spinning freely or floating on a bit of cork in a dish of water. And for reasons that we explained back in our episode about adamant, it always pointed north, and pretty accurately to boot. So if you marked the outside of the compass with measurements, you could always determine how far off true north you were facing. That made dead reckoning navigation easier in terms of knowing your direction, and it led to the development of Portland charts. You've probably seen pictures of such charts, or you've seen them used in movies. These are basically maps of the sea with all these crisscrossing lines radiating out from different points. Well, those lines indicated the direction and distance between two known points. With the compass to set your direction, you could follow those lines and navigate between two locations. Or even follow a path between multiple locations. But there was still a big limitation. You couldn't measure the speed of the ship. Even if you could estimate the passage of time, and even with a good chart and a compass, you had no idea where your ship was along its route. And worse, if you were off course, it could take you a long time to figure it out. This was the level of technology, by the way, that Christopher Columbus and Vasco da Gama had to work with at the end of the 15th century when they made their famous voyages. Columbus attempted to cross the Atlantic to reach India, and da Gama attempted to sail south around Africa and then continue east to India. Da Gama spent most of his time in coastal waters and was able to successfully complete his voyage. Columbus faced a much more difficult challenge. He figured if he just sailed due west, he'd hit Asia. But getting back would be tricky. And so, he kept a very accurate log. Every hour, he would cast a bit of wood over the edge of the ship and see how long it took the wood to pass two marks on the side of the ship. Thus, he could estimate his speed. He recorded his directions, course changes, hourly speeds, and information about the position of the stars. While he never did reach India because of a massive landmass in the way, he did reach the Americas. And that, of course, changed the course of history of Europe and the world forever. Now, Columbus's idea of tracking the speed of his ship with a floating bit of wood was a pretty clever trick in itself. And other sailors had methods of estimating the speed of their ships to help with dead reckoning navigation. But in the early 1500s, a new invention made it much easier to figure out the speed of a ship. It was called the chip log. The chip log was a log-shaped spool with a rope wound around it and a floating weight tied to one end. The rope was knotted, and each knot was exactly the same distance from each other knot. If you wanted to know the speed of your ship, here's what you did. You'd have someone turn over a special, small hourglass called a marine sand glass. Marine sand glasses work just like hourglasses. You have two glass bulbs connected with a stem and filled with sand. The sand slowly empties from the top bulb into the bottom bulb, and it always takes the same amount of time to empty. Thus, it could mark out a short period of time, like a half minute. So someone starts the marine sand glass and you toss the floating weight over the back of the ship. It drags on the rope, causing it to unwind. You determine how much of the rope unwinds while the sunglass runs by counting the knots. And that tells you the speed of the ship. In knots. And the chip log was such a ubiquitous and useful tool that to this day, ship speeds are usually measured in units called knots. Today though, one knot is defined as one nautical mile per hour. And a nautical mile is one sixtieth of a degree around the circumference of the Earth which translates to 1.1508 miles. But Columbus was also experimenting with some other new ideas in navigation, and his logs greatly helped scholars of the day refine a new form of navigation. The idea was simple enough. Because the Earth is a sphere, as you travel north or south, the sun, moon, and stars get higher or lower in the sky. And with a bit of fancy math and some good measuring tools, you could determine just how high or low in the sky something was. And doing that told you how far to the north or south you were of some arbitrary line drawn around the world. 
We call that line around the middle of the Earth the equator. While Columbus had to make his measurements by hand, and while his measurements were extremely inaccurate, eventually, astronomers developed tools specifically to measure the angular height of an object over the horizon. The first was a staff with a movable cross piece for sighting a stellar object called a cross staff. It was replaced by the more accurate astrolabe, and then the sextant. And so it was in the 16th century that everything was in place to facilitate voyages across the ocean. With the loss of land-based trade routes, Europeans had a reason to turn to the seas. Knowing that the world was a sphere provided a reason to sail west to reach the east. And even though that didn't work out, there was an entirely new land filled with resources to explore. Ships were large enough and durable enough to make the long crossing across the Atlantic Ocean. Latine sails allowed ships to travel in spite of contrary winds. The magnetic compass and other tools for stellar navigation allowed ships to determine their course with a reasonable degree of accuracy, and even their north-south position. The chip log and marine sand glass allowed ships to measure their speed with some degree of accuracy. And accurate logs and charts helped ships repeat earlier voyages. To go there and back again, as it were. But all of this still added up to navigation by dead reckoning. Sure, the measurements were more accurate, but the method was the same. Now, we could leave the story there. After all, we're well outside of the Middle Ages, and thus any further discussion is just beyond the scope of the fantasy genre we limit ourselves to. But that wouldn't be very satisfying. After all, there is one last development in the history of sailing and navigation and it is also one of the most important and historically significant. Fortunately, the seeds for that development were planted well before the Middle Ages were a thing. And some substantial inventions were made in the Middle Ages, some of which appear in some of our favorite fantasy games. And that's all the excuse we need. So join us next week for the final installment in our series on the history of exploration and the sea. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by The Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com. <laughs>